So good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to um, the SNUI interview with myself, Minister Simon Key. And it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce a friend and work colleague, Lynn Probert, who has the Certificate of Recognition um, by the Spiritualist National Union. And, um, and we want to sort of share our experiences together about our work for spirit. So um, I hope you'll give us your support this evening. And um, anyway, welcome, Lynn. Hello, Simon. Great to be here. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. So I know we go back quite a few years because I, I was thinking earlier yesterday about tonight and I was thinking I met I think I first met you when we were both working on one of Tony's courses at Brecon. That's right in Wales. In Wales. Yeah. 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 And I, I remember that very clearly. Yeah. That was probably about 15 years ago. Oh great. I know that's scary, isn't it? But yeah, it was about fifteen years ago. Yeah, so we've—I know we've sort of uh, worked with each other many, many times, and we've, we've we have seen each other outside of here as well, you know, outside of the college and so on. But anyway, if we can start, if you don't mind sharing your thoughts about how you and your experiences about how you came into spiritualism, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, I think, first of all, I was just very lucky that I come from a, a family on both sides, actually, where um, talk of the spirit world and life after life was pretty normal. So it was it was always around me. There was always conversations where, you know, many of my family, I, I remember one time um, my aunt and uncle had actually taken in. Uh, a boy that went to school with one of their sons because there was an issue at home and they came home one day and found him sitting underneath the table um, and he was you know scared stiff and he had heard this knocking and uh, heard someone walk down the stairs and up again and my aunt just said what are you doing under there he explained and she said oh that's all right that's granddaddy he always used to knock like that when he wanted something and it was just you know it was a normal thing so I, I think I was very lucky in that respect that it was never a subject that we couldn't talk about, although it wasn't a big focus either. So it, it was quite a natural thing. Yeah. And I think like all of us, we, we don't realise our sensitivity until we get a little bit older and we start to look back on it. And I think I, I recognise as I was getting older, the, this big thing for me was always about my words upsetting someone or the effect that I might have on someone else in the way I may say something. So that sensitivity was always there as well. So I became, I suppose, like the mother hen with my siblings and uh, wanted to make sure everyone was all right. And, and then I, I got into my teens and then I just started to become more and more aware of things. I knew someone was going to visit the house I knew someone was going to call I got this overwhelming sense of something was going to happen maybe and then I'd find out that someone had passed away you know a couple of days later mm. so there was always these things that started to make me inquire more and um, want to discover more and then at the age of 16 that was probably the big thing for me is it, it was almost over the overnight I, I just this overwhelming feeling one day I and it came from sort of my my gut in the way that I saw it back then I just knew that I was going to lose my dad young I didn't know how and I didn't know when but it was my acceptance of that that I really couldn't get my head around um, and because it was a real sort of acceptance that I had to prepare myself for that. And I was lucky that it was another 10 years with him um, uh, until I was 26 when he passed. So that really opened such a massive door for me in, in my mind um, and in, I suppose, the belief system that I didn't recognise was there. And that's when at the age of 16 was the first time I went to 
a spiritualist church, which was in Wimbledon, uh, where I lived. Uh, you will know it very well, Simone. Yeah, and so um, that sort of how I became more intrigued and more inquisitive, but I still wasn't ready at that age, I don't think, to sort of explore it more for myself um, with other people. I just wanted to, I think, probably wrestle with it more within my own mind and, and my own understanding for me at that point. So I didn't actually come into the aspect of development um, as we call properly, um, for, for quite a long time. And a lot of that was just due to circumstances in my personal life. But I know that when my dad did pass away, then that was the big thing for me that I now know that I was prepared for that, but didn't know how or why I was or who was preparing me for that. And that was when I really wanted to, I suppose, go on a bigger search. Mm. Yeah. So that's that's really how I, I came into it. So how from then on? So you know you've got you, you, you've got this this search basically for understanding. Yes. Um, and after yeah. that, how did you start to develop? Did you go to a circle? Did you keep going okay. to the church? You know. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. So I I think initially it just became more of um, conversations with other people, their views, their their. Um, I, I suppose their um, belief system of whether they believed there was something more than the physical life. Uh, and I went to churches a little bit more, um, but um, I had my son just after my father passed and because of medical problems, etc., in and out of hospital, it just wasn't the right time for me. So I read books, I talked to people, I went to church when I could. Um, but it wasn't until I was in, in my 30s uh, and I moved to the area I live in now, and it just happened that uh, I, I, I'd gone for a reading, sorry, backtrack. Um, <laughs> it's a bit like doing a contact, people. You have to go back over your evidence. <laughs> um, I, I, um, when my dad passed, I needed to have that proof from someone. I needed to know that he was still around me, and that was the first reading that I'd really gone and had um, in terms of mediumship and as a lot of people do and probably some of us do to others you know I was told you could do this you could do this and she actually ran a development circle herself and uh, invited me to go along so that was in in my late 20s and uh, I went and oh my goodness it was I was like an excited puppy because it was um, all new it was all different obviously um, but it was so exciting and I was saying things that someone could understand as well. And I was having experiences at that moment. And, you know, it, we were just looking at that sort of psychic, you know, aspect at that moment. Um, and it was really intriguing for me. So I, I got my proof, if you like, from someone else through that reading. She opened that door in my mind that said, you know, there's, there's potential here for you to develop, you know, what's, what's there with you. And um, I, I went there a couple of times, but as I said, because of my personal life, it just really wasn't the right time for me. And I think like everyone, whether, whether you want to doing it and being the right time for you to do it, I think is so key um, and so important for it to develop in the way that you want it to for yourself. And it just wasn't the right time for me back then. And so when I moved to the area I'm in now, it just so happened my neighbour had been to see someone um, for a reading and found out they ran a development circle, which was Sue Smith's, uh, Simone, you will know her. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, and so she called me and invited me and uh, I went along to the circle and that's when I sort of found out about the college I didn't even know the college existed I didn't know what the college was uh, and now you know people like Simone I'd never heard of Simone and uh, and I'm being told about all these people and now I, I work with these people which is a, a, a real privilege and a joy 
But I, I think for me, the circle, what that, what that did, and I, I went religiously weekly and then I started to do workshops where I could and then I discovered the college and then started to go to the college. And, and for me, I was always listening to other people and there were aspects of people where they would be saying, I just want to know when I can be out doing this. I just want to know how quickly I can be doing public readings. How quickly can I develop to be on a, a platform to do a demonstration? And for me, I didn't want to do any of that. So be careful what you say, people, because what you say you don't want to do, you do quite often end up doing. Uh, it's just the way that it moves you when you move to that point because it's the right time and the right thing for you. Um, I went because I was so grateful of that space because what I was learning in it was not just about mediumship I was learning about me and I never realized at the time when I started to explore you know the, the developed side of things I never realized that the biggest development was going to be the personal development and everyone thinks it's about mediumship and the personal development you know comes afterwards it's actually the other way around. You know, I think mediumship's a byproduct of, you know, the development of ourselves. And the more we develop that, you know, the, the spiritual aspect of ourselves and develop ourselves as an individual at being, you know, comfortable in our own skin and being comfortable with who we are and looking at life not through, you know, this, you know, thin corridor, just being so much more open to what, what life's about. Yeah. Um, that brings such a difference to your work and so by going to the circle each week and doing other things where I was able to what it did it it brought me just such a sense of peace of I felt complete there and I felt whole there which is something that we all find sort of hard to discover at times I think mm -hmm. um, but I, I was happy to be there where there's something good happened or it didn't happen because I just yeah. enjoyed being in that space and being you know supported energetically yeah. by other people but with like-minded people where you can just be you people don't care what car you drive what house you live in and what you do they just accept you for who you are as the individual and the spirit of you effectively yeah. um and and that's what I did so for the first three years of my development, it, it wasn't doing readings for people publicly or anything like that. It was just all practice, understanding, you know, time being reflective of myself, being comfortable with my own company, which I absolutely love. Um, and um, I, I find it strange when people say, oh, I, I couldn't go a day without talking to someone. I could. <laughs> Um, I love it because that's that's about you know feed, feeding your own soul because yeah. we're, we're doing so much for other people. So yeah. so that's how my sort of right, development yeah. started. Yeah, really. started. And, and mine and I'm not going into my story is not what this is about. But mine was very similar. Um, it, and like you, it was f for three years where I didn't oh. do anything. Yeah, I had three years. Yep. And I call them three long years, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> where I, mine was all about finding out. I wanted to understand it um, because I was sort of thrown into it. And I wanted to understand it and I didn't really get it. But it taught me, I, I think those three years taught me more about how to deal with sensitivity. And um, and I just feel that it's important that, and I'm seeing this a lot more today, actually, where when people are coming into this movement of ours, if you pardon the expression, yeah. now there's more and more coming in because they want to understand it, but not necessarily become anything, which yeah. is about personal development, which I am thrilled about. Oh. Because in my day, it was all about when could you work and when could you do that reading. Yeah. And yeah. I always believed that, it, you know, if ever I wrote a book, and I can assure you I'm never going to write a book, but if I was to write a book, the title of my book was going to be The Reluctant Medium, you know. <laughs> I think someone's already nicked that idea, so I'll leave that. <laughs> you know? uh, but it's, I, I, 
very, yeah, similar, it, very similar circumstances. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and, and Simone and I discovered that we um, lived in the same area as well growing up, which is uh, quite strange as well. Yeah. Well, it's not strange, but yeah. but like, like you, I'm thrilled that people are more um, open-minded and more keen and interested to discover the sensitivity side of what we do. Yeah. Um, and I, I think what people don't recognize, and one thing that I've, I've really tried to sort of express in as many ways as I can, is that there's so much focus on evidence, 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 and being the, you know, the production role that we play and sort of almost this production line. But what people are really missing the point of is that we're, we're not just opening our mind and awareness to you know communicators that want to talk to their loved ones yes that's that's the role we play but we're actually having an experience yeah. our mediumship is not just you know verbal information and it's not just a statement of fact with every piece of information that we receive or perceive, we're having a wonderful experience, but everybody seems so focused on the detail of the information, yeah. Yeah. but not, not the experience itself. And by allowing themselves to just relax into that space and recognize that this is an amazing experience that they could really embrace and get so much more from, yeah. And and they would recognise also more of their own sensitivity with within that space, and everything seems so fast and so um, rigid. Yeah. And the preparation, you know, if if we're not going to take time to consider what we're doing and give it the respect and honour it in the way that we should, you know, we, if we want to be the best, you know, advocate for. Um, spiritualism and we are the pioneers of the future all of you guys are the pioneers of the future you know we have to also respect ourselves in the preparation that we apply and the time and not just right I'm sitting down shoving the hoover in the cupboard and right here we go here's a reading or I need to just you know get as many people in this demonstration because it's a, a, about money because it's yeah. not about that um, and about and, fame and fortune yeah yeah, yeah. exactly but to me what is fame and fortune yeah. you know it's yeah. I, I mean <laughs> what, what we're also having within this experience what we're doing is we're also creating this uh, amazing ability to bring a sense of healing just in that moment of time with someone. Because in that moment when we're working with, let's just say we're working with someone's mum and we're talking and we've got mum from the spirit world, we've got daughter in front of us, just for that time that we're with them, whether it's 20 minutes, whether it's 30, 40, 60, it doesn't matter, just for that moment in time, they're not gone for them. Their pain and their grief is not so heavy. That time, it's as if that, that there's been a pause button on the yeah. missing from their life. I and think so, it's so absolutely so important for people to recognise that because, and I think more mediums should acknowledge that all mediumship is a form of healing. And absolutely. it can come from that foundation. And that every word that's said should be something that encourages, supports, you know, uplifts, yeah. up, enlightens, whatever words you want to use. Yeah. But it's going yeah. to be positive. And one of Absolutely. the things that I've discovered, actually more so since, this, since March when we first went into the lockdown, is because I have more time. I'm not, as we talked about before we came on here, we've, we've got more time to explore um, because it's, you know, we, we're setting up our own timing as such, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. and I am actually enjoying exploring the personality. It's almost like I've gone back to the beginning again yeah. because trying to define the difference between someone's mum and someone else's mum yeah. yeah. and how they tick and how they perceive life. Yeah, and that's absolutely. what I'm enjoying. That's what the part of my work that I enjoy. Yeah, it's, it's bringing them back. No, not in a physical way, of course not, but but in a way that that person knows that they have survived physical death. Yes. But more importantly, that they're import they're involved in their lives. Um, absolutely. Yeah. And I I was talking to a, a group just recently, 
and I was saying what I what I did was because we have this perception of what people want from us as as a reader and as a medium and we you know there's always the fear there there's always the concern am I going to meet their need am I going to bring who you know am I going to be able to connect with who that they want to hear from etc cetera, etc cetera. but what I what I did was I, I really thought about this <clears throat> and there's a, there's a huge amount of pressure that we all put on ourselves because right. of that and I understand it I understand it it's human nature but what I did was I thought back to that very first reading that I went for when I lost my dad and I thought, what, what did I actually go for? And there were just two things. There was the hope that he would come to communicate with me and just to know that he loved me. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. And so it's all based on love, which is, you know, the, the basis of everything that we do within our work yeah. and, and everything else is what the medium perceives that they should be doing. Yeah. And as long as we open our mind to, to that aspect that they're coming to communicate because of the love, not that they had, but they still have. Yeah, it's just cool. that yeah. ability to just be Absolutely. in the presence of each other again. It's mm. like a telephone call and we're, we're the operator. Mm. And, you know, we can either lead our contacts by deciding what information we want to go for or deciding what that information is all about and trying to make sense of it and probably changing it and messing it up along the way. <laughs> or just we can just, yeah, just take it. that small second yeah. and follow the communicator in what it is that they want to talk about and looking at the relevance of, you know, it's, don't, don't get me wrong. I know we practice lots of different things to, to mm. just open our mind and awareness and expand our sort of ability to, to get things like, uh, let's just say maybe we, we did an exercise and you're going to try and get a telephone number and a car registration. You know, we, we've done all those things to just open our minds to the potential that all of those things are possible. Yeah. But yeah. the reality is, yes, they're possible, but what's the relevance of them? The, re the, the, the car registration number is wonderful if you've still got the car. The car, the telephone number is wonderful if you then back it up with the fact that your dad knows that that's how you remember his voice, answering his number, and this is how he used to say it. Yeah. So, well, if we've not got the, what's the relevance of that information, otherwise we're just blurting out facts that yeah. actually yeah. they've got no meaning and yeah. they've got no feeling. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. For, yeah. For, for me... When we're bringing something to our sitter um, that has a meaning, for me, where there's meaning, there's healing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, totally agree with you. So uh, following on from that, I mean, obviously I know that, you know, we are very passionate about um, spirit communication um, uh -huh. in all areas of mediumship. But following on from that, what would you say at the moment, because I know this is going to change, because it does, what part of your work do you enjoy most? Oh, <laughs> my mind's going in all different directions now. <laughs> um, I, I think I, I do. I love the teaching. I absolutely love the teaching because I love people seeing people experience something they didn't think they could achieve yeah. and remembering what it was like to be in that place <laughs> and st still just grateful that I can still do it as well. Um, <laughs> uh, but I also, I love that. I love the emotional reunion between people. I love, and like you were saying, working with the personality mm. and, and really the relationship between these two people, the communicator and, and the recipient. And I think being in that space to, to me gives, gives me a real buzz. Mm. But I, I think we get this wonderful glimpse into someone's life and realise how much they were loved or we recognize how special this was to them or how special they were to each other. That, that really is, is a great place to be. Um, and as I said, the, the teaching for me, I, I really do um, enjoy because um, I, I suppose because I've been nurtured along the way 
um, and pushed along the way as well. I will put you into the list of oh, the, thank you. <laughs> the people that have encouraged me, Simone. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have to say, without people like yourself and, and others, I wouldn't be where I am and doing what I'm doing today. So to be able to do for someone else um, what's been, you know, very kindly shared with me, because what what we learn, uh, and again, it's that personal development, isn't it? What we learn isn't just for ourselves. It's for everyone around us and it's to be shared and it's to be nurtured. And everything we do is, is about nurturing. Um, and I, I think I'm still enjoying, um, <laughs> I don't know if I should admit this really, but um, I'm, still, I'm still enjoying at my age um, finding out things, still things about myself, you know? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I never thought I would enjoy working on a screen, but I was just saying to Simone before we started to, to be able to travel the world and not pack a suitcase has been heaven, I have to say. Um, but also to be so available to people now as well. I, I think this has, has changed things for a lot of people that may be uh, nervous going out, uh, don't like to go out of an evening, um, socially not so comfortable mixing with groups. This has given people, uh, also people that can't leave their homes for various reasons, um, the ability to maybe not be lonely and to know that there's a space for them to go and to recognise that, they're accepted no matter where they are or who they are. And, and again, that's part of our work, isn't it? It's about the acceptance. Because I know, you know, as um, sort of chairman of, um, of chair of SNUI, I, I feel the, the whole foundation of SNUI is about achieving a sense of community. Yes. And that's what we do in our work, you know, outside of SNUI. I mean, yeah. is we, you know, we're, we're looking at helping people of like mind, if you like, to to understand the abilities that they've got, and and yeah. to recognise that there are going to be problems within that too, and that yeah. we're going to be there to try and help them. And I don't know about you, but since this horrific pandemic, which I refuse to talk about, um, I've <laughs> I've recognised um, so many people have got greater needs now. Yes. You know, the number of people I've worked with whose whose loved ones have passed with COVID. Yeah. You know, and it just brings it so much closer to us. It, it, it does. And I think also they've got a, a greater need to hear from people, even if it's, you know, not people that have passed recently because of the current circumstances, but just their family in general and the spirit world to just know that they're being supported through what is the most difficult time of people's lives and just to know that they're there and just to come with that sort of upliftment, as you say, and that love and, you know, a little bit of laughter and talking about what they've been recognising, births in the family, new houses and, you know, whatever it is, or just that moment in, in, the, in sitting in the dark you know, thinking of that person, you know, coming to say, I, I was with you when you were sitting at two o'clock in the morning because you couldn't sleep uh, and you, you were thinking of me, but I was there. Mm. And, and so I, I think at the moment people do have a greater need. I, I think the other thing as well is what it's done is because it's, it's forced people into having so much more time, uh, um, one on their own sometimes yeah. uh, or just in your your family unit um, and having so much more time um, in terms of a slower pace of life mm. that it's given people um, ultimately the um, I suppose the luxury of becoming so much more um, aware in terms of self-awareness mm. I think it's opened people's minds a little bit more to the afterlife and probably with some people where they've been thinking I'm going to do that one day or I'm going to start to read about that a little bit more or I must find a church to go to or uh, someone to talk to this about it's it's given uh, many people I think the time to reflect on their beliefs and maybe is this something that is real um you know my heart is telling me yes and my head is saying well maybe no 
and it's given them the space and the time to to explore it a little bit more and as you say find communities like this where they can talk to other people and share their their thoughts and and maybe start to explore classes and and circles and groups and things to understand what what their potential is yeah and I, th- I, I feel that this is a time now that for all of us, we've all experienced whether, you know, to a greater or lesser degree, but we've all experienced change. And that change is here to stay, you know, and there's and, and, and the life and, and the world is going to change along with it. And yeah. so we have to adapt. And I feel that mediums have to adapt just as much, if not more, perhaps, than other people to recognise that, you know, for instance, I, you know, one of my one of my big issues with modern day mediumship is, you know, when people keep bringing through grandmothers who knit and sew and cook and all of that. And I'm the one screaming, you know, grandmothers today are eating uh, are like me. They want to eat out of a microwave. They don't want to be spending hours cooking. They don't, and, and they've got they've got tattoos. They've got piercings, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> their life and and even when they're talking about people of the past who who cooked in the kitchen with the apron and the rolling pin that individual still has a life yes and they've chosen not to acknowledge that i know you know and that that worries me as well because we've got to move on absolutely It, it is frustrating and i said to someone recently um if you describe me as the grandmother in the kitchen with the rolling pin then it really isn't me and when i do get to the spirit world i will be coming to talk to you <laughs> because you know i'm a grandmother i've got eight grandchildren nearly nine um and i'm the, i'm the one that's on the trampoline doing star jumps and dancing in the living room and doing you know water slides are fully closed because they're going come on man do it do it and so I, I do these crazy things because that's what creates memories for them and and, and for me and and I hope those are the things that they'll remember in, in years to come but you know life has changed so much uh, and and this time you know again is is going to be very strange in our mediumship because uh, I was thinking about this the other day uh, it is going to be strange because you know at the moment we talk about what people do with their lives yeah. and it will be very strange to be working with someone from the spirit world where they've had this period of isolation of you know over a year of not not doing anything or not leaving their houses with some people just not been out at all and so you know there will be that change to our mediumship and and like you say you know people people aren't just what uh, we perceive them to be that they're not just this Sort of figure yeah, yeah. Um, and, and some people they look the most unassuming to, to look at but they've had the most amazing yeah. lives yeah that's and what, I know I've, I've that's told a story yeah. yeah I've told a story before at a church in the UK and this lovely lady always greets me at the door and she's probably in her um, 80s I would say very lovely made up and she's all put together but quite quiet and then someone said to me you know do you know what she uh, she's got a pilot's license and uh, she used to put her children in a boat a speedboat on a Sunday morning and, t- and drive over to France for breakfast now I mean you know she's this quiet little lady in a church and she's had the most amazing life and yet we, we perceive that person from the spirit world and we've got this grandmother in her 80s that, you know, spent a lot of her time dedicating time to a church, you know, when she's in the spirit world, obviously. Um, and and will, will we open our mind to the potential that there's so much more about her? Yeah. So much more. Um, it, you know, if each and every person here just thought about what they've done in their life already to <laughs> now... And you know the plans because we've all been yeah. we've all been saying when this is over I'm going to do when this is over I'm going to plan uh, and we're making it's over I'm going to eat out <laughs> <laughs> <With you. laughs> so um, what do you I just want to ask you what does working at the Arthur Finney College mean to you as a course organizer as a tutor. What does that mean to you? It, it's very hard to put into words. I mean, I, I went to this 
wonderful, majestic building, um, very naive in, in my sort of development in those early days. And I remember being there as if I was like this um, sort of unseen person to start with. It's almost like, am I allowed to walk in this room? Am I allowed to go here? Because it is just, for anyone that's not been there, it's just uh, the most amazing place to be. Yeah. And there's, there's something about it that when you walk in there, you feel home, mm. even though you may not have been there before. I, I remember my first ever um, course that I attended there during the week um, in the evening we just had to a friend and I just nipped down to the village to get something and um, I remember we, we drove out and we got down to the village and it's only a small village there's not a lot going on and I looked at her and I said I don't like it out here and she said no neither do I let's go back um, and we couldn't wait to drive back up the driveway to the college and we both went Oh, I'm home yeah. and it, it is like being yeah. in a bubble and so when yeah. I went there I do actually call it cuckoo land yeah yeah it is <laughs> it, you, don't, you don't watch the news you no. don't newspaper no you know you you're you're completely protected from life itself uh, absolutely you don't, to, you don't even have to cook a dinner you know i mean I, it's, know. You know. I, I, I remember being there one year you may have been there at the same time Simon, and all the villages around us there was hailstones there was lightning yeah. a, a roof had come down it was flooded and we had sunshine and yeah. it was just like this little oasis in the <laughs> middle of all this disaster around us and we were all you know having a wonderful time yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> so so when i first when i first went there um did i ever envisage working there absolutely not um i i never thought that i would uh, you know be of a standard to work there because you you don't consider yourself in that way. Well, I certainly didn't. Yeah. Um, and it was only you that say, Lynn, Lynn, get your act together. Come on, <laughs> fill those forms out. <laughs> um, and, and I and I did, and and I'm very very grateful that I did. To to me, it's it's such a special special place that there is. Um, this wonderful feeling there that not just you're at home for, for me it, it is a huge privilege you know and I, I can't say that enough um, and I still sometimes when I'm there think god am I really teaching here because that's how special it is but I think it's what you see that takes place within it I think it's when you see someone come that's so maybe broken through grief that finds a little bit of their strength again yeah. and maybe not walks out complete but goes out with hope when you see someone that spent so long hoping to hear from a relative and that week it happens when you see people um finding themselves along the way and saying i know good and at the end smiling say i did it um, and when you see all those transformations taking place and you know that it's not because of you as a teacher, but that you have witnessed it and that you've supported that space, you know, whether it's that individual or whether it's the group or whether it's the course, it doesn't matter. But the fact that you've been part of the transformation and life changing experience that someone else has just gone through because for me it was a life-changing experience the first time I went yes, and I think that, Very yeah and, yes. and I think that that first week for me it changed my life so much mm. to be part of that for other people I think is what's the biggest gift for me yeah, and one of the, one of the things that I, I love. I mean, obviously, I love my job as a teacher and um, a, as a medium, anyway, and as a healer. But one of the things I, I I loved as well, and I miss at the moment, is working with people at the college. Yes. You know, like my friends, like yourself and others. You know, because the one thing people don't realise is how much we laugh. You know. Oh. How much we send each other up? Not students, never. No. We send students up, but we send each other up 
mercilessly you know <laughs> we, we we do we're, we're sort of um yeah we're, re we're each other's evening entertainment i think sometimes <laughs> um, we let our hair down and just you know sometimes it's just sitting up in our room and uh at the lounge that we have at the college uh with a cup of coffee or a glass of wine and we're we're just sitting chatting but yes we do we laugh and we laugh and we laugh yeah. and it normally is at each other yeah and I, I know there have been so many weeks where I've been desperate to go home because I hurt so much from laughing, you know. Yeah, and I think also it's it's knowing that you're, you're, you're there with your own courses or you're there with your teaching team, but also everybody's there supporting each other. Um, and that you, you can see, you get to know each other in a way that you can see, oh, that's uh, may, maybe um, I'm, I'm going to go and give that one a hand today because, oh, she's maybe not feeling so well or, you know, he's got to do that. And so everyone just sort of steps in and adds a little bit of support, whether it's, uh, come on, let's go for a walk around the garden. Um, uh, or, or you don't do outside, do you? No. But, um, <laughs> no. Oh, <laughs> you, you will after this, Simon. You will after this. <laughs> I'm sure. I, I, do, I, did. <laughs> I haven't been out for about three weeks. I mean, I haven't been out at all. Wow. You know? Out, no, out. No, no. <laughs> but I was working with um, Janet Nohar, New Jersey, recently. Yep. And before we started working, she said to me, Simon, do you ever do you ever go and, and swim in the ocean? And she <laughs> on my face and said oh my god I just saw your face you obviously don't <laughs> no. you don't do fresh hair <laughs> well, I think I'd just go into shock if I was to do that <laughs> <laughs> so how do you see how do you see the future not your future but the future of spiritualism and what would you like to see what I would like to see and, and what I see I, I suppose are quite different I, I suppose my concern for spiritualism going forward is that um that people become too individual and independent that there's no community because I've seen that happen quite a lot over the last sort of several years mm -hmm. and that does sadden me because I, I think that it's it's become a little bit more competitive than it should be it should not be that way and it should be about each other and you know our opinions and other people are just that their opinions so you know they, they shouldn't be out there my concern is that it 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 could sort of fracture slightly and I hope that's not the case um I, I think there's strong enough people to you know hold people together yeah. what, I, what I would really love to see uh, I think is going back uh, a little bit like you said earlier a little bit more to the basics going back to the the foundation and the fundamentals of the individuals where they're going back to really become so much more aware of self and so much more aware of the presence of themselves the presence of the spirit world those communicators because I, I i was said <laughs> i was thinking you know if you if you have someone that comes if you hold a party and someone uh, that you've invited brings a friend um you know we, we're very gracious and we say come in you know it's nice to meet you make yourself comfortable whatever whatever you wouldn't say hello who are you what's your name where do you live how many people have you got in your family what do you do for a living um uh, and what's your occupation and what are your interests and uh, what <laughs> what time are you born and etc etc you know and that's we, we almost attack the spirit world when when they sort of come into that space with us because we want so much from them so quickly and yet we're not taking just that moment to appreciate the presence of them and that I, I think that that would be such a lovely thing to start to explore more about just the presence of the spirit world, the presence of communicators and not straight into, you know, that sort of um, machine gun fire. Uh, and the thing is, yes, 
a lot of us do work quickly. I, I know I do, I know but I the and, and I know you do, mm -hmm. and and so that that becomes the the way we work. But I, I think for people that are coming into it. I think they come into it and see what other people are doing and they want to be that right from day one. And it doesn't work because you miss so much of the beauty of it all. It. They're not enjoying no. it. They're just enduring it. And that's what upsets me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, people do uh, a weekend workshop and then they're out booking halls to do yeah. demonstrations. There's, there's nothing to demonstrate because you don't even understand yourself in those early days, let alone understand your mediumship. And you've got to understand more about your mediumship and yourself to really understand the medium that you are. And all of those things take time to discover and explore and... I know, I, I know exactly what you. I think I know exactly what you're saying because I know that over the, the, the recent years, I've noticed more and more people when they're looking to mediumship, they want to become something. They want to yeah. work. They want to work in theatres, you know, big town halls, but they're not prepared to do that little backstreet church, yeah. which is where we learn the psychology of mediumship. Absolutely, that's where you, that's where your training ground is. You know. That's how you learn how to handle people and yep. how to work with people. And that yep. upsets me, that yep. people are not prepared to put themselves out to find out about the work itself. Yeah, um, absolutely. And that, that time of your, you know, your own development and understanding your own mediumship and those you know, intimate spaces of one-to-one -one readings, that's really where we find uh, our work and we find our understanding of, um, how we can work through difficult situations to then take it to a church to then move on to those bigger things if, yeah. if that's you know what's what's needed yeah but but certainly people think oh I don't want to do readings I just want to demonstrate not realizing that actually your one-to-one -one readings are the foundation of your demonstration absolutely, absolutely. you so know you if, you, if you know can't do it spirit because you've Sorry? got how you get to how we get to know the spirit because we have more time you know absolutely <laughs> absolutely yeah. yeah yeah it's it's where we can we can expand we can deepen we can develop information um we can really build upon that the power that we work in together and and recognize the difference of when we're in it and when we're not rather than just assuming we're in it yeah. and all of those things are, are really um what comes within that one-to-one -one space and I, I think that's where people you know when they go to a demonstration sort of space too too quickly it doesn't sustain them it doesn't right. sustain them they don't last very long um and then the conf confidence gets affected because it's not working as productively uh, and they're not enjoying the experience the pressure is too big because they've not built upon the foundation of the work that's there um and and so many people are looking i want this and i want that but look at where you are look at what you've already got you know nurture what's there and let that develop and become stronger and then you start to feel more secure and then you feel a little bit more confident or because you're confident in handling as you say situations people circumstances information is I don't think we ever feel truly confident as the individual because we've got that vulnerability about us, but we yes. need that anyway. Yeah. Um, but you, you feel confident in handling situations um, and circumstances and but, places and people. Uh, yeah. And that's all through experience. Everything yeah. is about experience, isn't it? Yeah. You know, Absol yeah. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. Yeah, and that's that's really your your education grounds. That's your that's your learning space. Classes are great and books are great and all of those things, but it's really your experience that becomes your education, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and and yeah, sorry. What, what, I was gonna say the, yeah, the, the same that sorry. <laughs> the, the same that goes for people that go into teaching too quickly as well. Mm. You know. I, I see people that go into teaching that aren't actually working themselves. Well, you know, if you're not working and you're not doing readings and you're, you're not able to demonstrate, then you, you shouldn't be teaching it. 
because yes. again your experiences are your education to help and teach others and you really don't want to be responsible for other people's development if you've not explored yours to the depths that it needs to be you know taken and nurtured and understood yeah and i i actually find that amazing that a lot of people think that it's a natural step forward to go from the medium to the teacher and it yeah. isn't no it isn't no. it isn't for everybody and you no. can see it because you know um some people have this idea that you know it is a natural step and it isn't you know and no. they need and often we see people who need to develop their own confidence before they do that how can Absolutely. you assess somebody else if you can't assess yourself you know no. so that, yeah. that seems I'm, a bit strange to me but i was going to ask you what is your favourite subject at the moment? Because I know this changes all the time. What's your favourite subject to talk about or lecture on at the moment? Um, the experience of mediumship. Right. I understand that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I can, I can yeah, see. The, the, yeah. the fact that it's that we are having an experience and, and looking at more detail in that and getting people to realise that, um, you know, it's it's not just, you know, Thanks. words and statements that we're firing out there's so much more that takes place yeah yeah and I feel that my approach to mediumship I'm talking about on the the one-to-one the -one especially or or in the demonstration it has a much softer approach now to what it did in the beginning you know mine was a bit like you know as if you were firing a gun that was how I was thinking <laughs> you know whereas now for me it is about unfolding a story yes. or a memory yeah. or or an experience yeah. that they that they've shared that's how yes. i prefer it now you know yeah. so i'm an, i'm yeah. not I'm not so hard on myself but more importantly i'm more if you pardon the expression but natural with it you know yeah. um i i feel but i wished i'd known that 10 years ago you know? yeah, I, yeah absolutely I, I agree and i i went through a period where after and, and you you know what this is like you after every demonstration you do you start to analyze and then i'd be looking i could have gone deeper there yeah. oh i shouldn't have missed that oh i didn't do that mm, wasn't a strong and and you go you know over these things and and what it made me realize well two things what it made me realize that I wasn't allowing myself to grow all the time I was looking at what I wanted to go you know I, I suppose add or contribute to but what I was also doing I was devaluing the message that I'd just given to someone yeah, absolutely. because although I was criticizing myself I was saying that message not good enough for yeah. you well actually yes yeah. it was because yeah. that communicator wouldn't have come and so yeah. I really changed what what changed I think for me was i after every dem, you know, I'll just say I really enjoyed that. Um, and that is because if, even if it didn't, you know, go in the way that I would have hoped, I still enjoyed what I learned from it. Yeah. I always remember um, a very good friend of mine, Muriel Tennant, who's in the spirit world now. You met, you remember Muriel. And we yeah. were good friends. And I remember when I did a service, she'd often come with me or if she did a service, I'd go with her. And I remember once she said to me when I was pulling my work apart for the nth amount of time, you know, she said to me one day, you know, she said, have you any idea what you do to the spirit world when you do that? Yeah. And I, that stopped me. That really stopped yeah. me in my, my tracks. And it really made me realize what I was actually doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just, and it's, yeah. It's yeah, um, absolutely. You, you don't look at that other side of things. It's a bit like, you know, so many people will say, I never get names and I never get this and I can't do that. And and I, I said, well, in that respect, if you're saying you can't do that, you're saying the spirit world's not there because we know that information will be there. It's just whether we're able to, you know, Inverted. perceive yeah. it, receive yeah. it. So. Yeah. If you know the spirit world are there, you can't say that's that's not possible. Yeah. But it's yeah. like everything. It's about giving yourself permission to be wrong, I think, yeah. and not fearing that word no, because I think that no is just about exploring what maybe we've misunderstood, yeah. what we've uh, you know not seen clearly, heard clearly, felt in in the correct way, mm -hmm. um, and and so on that basis, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's about saying 
you know, I, it's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay that I may get things maybe slightly out of perspective in the way that I've presented them, but it's not to say that it's wrong. It's just that I just need to go back and revisit that space, revisit that experience. I think also, I think because you and I, we're quite similar in this, you know, that because we are very self-critical, um, we are inclined to forget how the recipient of that message felt as well. Yeah. And because we don't know every detail, we repeat words, but we don't know the deeper meaning of them. We no. forget that side. We look at what we've done and how could yeah. we have got a better connection, better yeah. information and so on. But we yeah. forget the impact it has on the recipient. Yeah. And, and I feel that now that by an, over analyzing, I always think you should sort of look back over your work, but over analyzing, tearing it apart, destroying your work is actually saying to them, your message was rubbish. Yeah. I mean, that's touched the very essence of them. Absolutely. And, and it's a transformational power. And, yeah. so, and, I, and I find that quite frustrating when I look back and see how I was for so many years, so many yes. years. You know? yeah. No, I, I agree. And I, I go back to that first reading I ever had, and I remember coming out of it. I don't remember anything that was said, um, but I do remember how it made me feel. And I just remember thinking, I really want to explore this, this part of me. And if I can make one person feel the way that, that lady just made me feel with that message from my dad then I would do an amazing job yeah. and so hopefully I've done it with more than one person in the last 20 <laughs> odd years um, yeah. but you know, it's just that feeling and again it's it's about as you say it's people won't remember what you say but they'll never forget how you made them feel yes. and they'll remember everything that they said yes to if they've got a good memory and as the medium you'll remember everything they said no to <laughs> yeah. because you're trying to work out what you miss um and, and that's a fact as well but yeah. I, I think when we sort of strip it back once more it's just about the simplicity mm. it's about people coming together and it's about the emotion um you know that has been brought in that space and it's about as you say how you how you touch someone because every time you touch someone in your work there's part of you that is touched and therefore that's another growth of you as the medium and person that moves into the next stage of your work in whatever that is that you do mm -hmm. so everything you know that we give we also receive in so many ways definitely but i I've, i'm i'm recognizing over the years now how addictive this work is it not not the actual work itself but the power we're in Oh, and yes. Absolutely obsessive. You know it and you don't even have to justify yourself. You no, know? it's, it's, yeah, it's just like, um, yeah, you, you're not quite sure what your mouth is, why you're Really, and there's so much coming out that you didn't even know that it was going to come out, but it's all understood and it all makes sense. Yeah. And it is, it is, it's, there's such a freeing feeling with it as, as well. Such a freeing feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Worker, I know that you work very, very hard. Um, but how do you balance your work with your life? Um, I, I didn't always get it right, but I've, I've, I've improved with age, I think. Um, I, I think in, in those early days, you, you start to be in, invited to do things, you are asked to do readings, dams, and, and you just start to sort of put it in your diary and then you suddenly realise, oh, um, <laughs> I'll put the family in that little bit and I'll put me in that little bit and you try to fit your family around your work and that, that really is not, not good um, and, and so it, it was very hard for a period of time and that, as you say this work is addictive as well because we, we love doing it we're passionate about it we don't want to let people down we don't want to say no to people 
but at some point we have to recognize that actually if we're not being good to ourselves, we're no good to other people either um and so quickly and interrupt you sorry about that but it's just but it's very hard I, I i really want people to understand who don't work in the way that we do how hard it is to refuse to do work that you love yes yeah that's it the is, hard part it's easy to refuse work that you don't like oh absolutely <laughs> absolutely but and it is it is very hard and so what you try and do then is you try and fit all those things in mm. so that you're not letting anyone down and then by the time you've finished you realize actually you've you've sort of twisted yourself inside out in on many occasions and you yeah. think how am I going to fit all this in yeah. or well I'm just gonna have to keep going with it and in in the end what that does is you then get to a point that you're so exhausted with it, you're not enjoying it. And that's when you know you need to take a break. And for any of you that, you know, are putting yourselves under pressure like that, you you have to then find those times. So what I do now is, you know, as you know, Simone, our diaries, we work sort of one, two years ahead. Um, So before I open my diary now, um, I I don't switch off unless I'm away as easily now as I I could do. My husband doesn't switch off at all unless we're away from, you know, the house and business, etc. So we we try and go away sort of two, three times a year. Um, And so we put a date in the diary, early, middle, late, Mm. so that if one of them has to give, you know, we've still got good good time. And I put time in my diary for um, things like, you know, grandchildren's birthdays and things yeah. like that where where I can um you know some things that aren't always as easy to juggle but I try and do that as much as I can so that I get the balance with family and then my work goes around that and I, I try and only work sort of so many weekends in a month so that uh, again i've got a little bit more of of a balance so that if i'm working flat out during the week at least i've got the weekends and you know we can be family it is so important because you you need that time to i i never thought i would own enjoying doing things in the house you know housework things like that (laughs) normal things that actually just make you feel human again because you 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 work so tirelessly in what you do and what you love and because you you invest so much of your emotional time and your energy and you know as much as it's also uh, amazing to do we're dealing with grief on a daily basis and we're dealing with problems in people's lives on a daily basis yeah, that's that's heavy yeah. that's heavy and it's hard mm. and so you have to have that time where so I have those those times in my year and get the balance as 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 well as I can um and that's the time that I don't deal with my emails my computer goes off we go away um and I try not to when I'm at home and, and I'm not working every weekend I try not to deal with any mail or calls then as well um, <laughs> I, I think uh, well I'm, tr- I'm trying I'm a work in progress at the moment but um but yeah I you you have to because otherwise you you end up being not fulfilled in your personal life because you never got your time to enjoy it. And then you feel guilty when you're doing your work because you should be with yeah. your family. So then you end up not enjoying yeah. that. So if you have yeah. if you get the balance, no. yeah, if, if you get the balance yeah. a little bit better, yeah. you have the, the best of both worlds. You really do. Mm. I know you sent me a message recently to say that you and Mia had said that I was the one that answered the emails the quickest or something, you know. I said you're the queen, queen of emails. I mean, some, Simone is just, uh, I mean, I'm, t- I'm terrible. Um, and because I, you know, I, I get a lot of emails and, and family yeah. stuff as well. Yeah. And I know you do, but Simone is just like, she must have this little radar that says, you know, answer. Because I sent, I sent her an email and straight away it comes back. So, um, yeah. And the reason to to no, it, it, there is a reason for it because if I don't have emails to do, I've got a clear mind. Oh, no, that's how I do it. I get rid of them. <laughs> I, I, know that I, can, I don't have to worry about, oh, I must get back to that person or this person or whatever. So for me, it's about having a clear mind. That's why I'm quick at it, if you know. There's oh, well, that's, okay. No. I'll, I'll take that on board. I'm, okay. I'm not sure it'll work for me, yeah. but I will take it on board. Okay. So I know I, I did mention this to you before we started um, about, you know, because I know that, you know, we like 
awful lot. And thank God, because you need a good sense of humour in this work. Um, because, it's, because you're always hearing the harder side of life. So you need something else to lighten it up, I think. So uh, do you have any particular stories about um, that made you laugh in your work with spirit or any? Um, can you remember? I'm not I, was, I was trying to think, and I can't think of sort of one particular where it comes to the spirit world. I, I, there's a funny one. Well, it wasn't so funny at the time um, <laughs> where... Um, you know, just just to enlighten people that it isn't always the glamorous life that everyone thinks that uh, it should be. And uh, the the first time I was invited to work overseas, and I won't say where it was, um, but I was invited, and I went with a colleague. And the host that had organised it said, you know, I've got accommodation and, uh, you know, I'll put you up so it'll keep the cost down rather than hotel. We thought that was very nice, very gracious. So we get there and she lived in an apartment and she only had one spare room and uh, one single bed. Now there are two of us. <laughs> so um, she gave me a camp bed and I had that in the living room. So that was the start to my first bit of international work. And then when we got to uh, go and do the private readings, it was in a, an area where it was highly Catholic and uh, obviously, you know, you shouldn't do it. So it was a disused shop with a big black curtain over the door and we were ushered in quickly now we got inside and there was an office and a store cupboard well guess I got the camp bed so I got the store cupboard um and and then um <laughs> and then she had a dog that she never used to take out and used to let it you know do its business in the bathroom mm. so I know so I said to my friend well I've had the camp bed and the office and the cupboard so guess what you've got <laughs> <laughs> good for you <laughs> <laughs> that was Natalie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can see her face. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So so yeah. yes, we, we we've yeah. had some fun and we've had some laughter and, and yeah. we did we did have some laughter and I think I think this story, the one, I mean, I've had, there's lo so much stuff I've laughed at over the years, but the one that stays in my mind was a long time ago when I lived in an old farmhouse in the middle of, in middle of fields, nowhere. And um, not that I ever went out, but I did live there. And, <laughs> and then um, I, I was doing a, a readings at home and I was doing this reading from this woman and she had to drive a good two or three hours to me, you know, which is a long way for me for a reading. And she turned up and she turned up with this cake and she said, I've brought you your cake. I went, what? I didn't ask for a cake. She said, you did. You asked me to bring you a good quality cake. And I'd asked her to bring me a good quality tape. And, <laughs> and, I, and to this day, I have visions of what I was supposed to do with this cake. Was I supposed to psychometrize it or something? <laughs> But I can imagine all these people turning up at my house with cakes. You know? <laughs> and I just think sometimes the work is bonkers, you know, what people I think know. and how they it, think it works and so I, on. I, know. I, I, I do remember one girl that came to me years ago for a reading and she... Uh, um, she'd not been to me before and she sat down, sat cross-legged on a chair and she was very comfy and, and literally I was about 30 minutes into the reading and then she just stood up and went, where's your toilet? <laughs> and I said, oh, it's just along the hallway and she went, okay, hold on a minute, I'll be back. And off she went and then came back, <laughs> sat down, cross-legged, she went, you can carry on now. I said, oh, thank you. <laughs> and I mean, it is, it's crazy, some of the things that happen. Um, and I remember a colleague of ours saying that they did a reading for someone and they, they were sitting in the power room. When they opened their eyes, this the sitter was laying in a fetal position on the floor. And they said, um, are you okay? Oh, yes, I feel so much more comfortable. I feel more at one with my family. And they didn't have the heart to say, well, can you sit on the chair? And they went, okay, and just carried on with the reading. <laughs> I know. Um, Sometimes it's absolutely bonkers what we have to put up with. I know. And, yes. and, uh, but um, it's all worth it. Absolutely, because uh, we just have to be adaptable and flexible. I think you know. Yeah, you certainly do. <laughs> yeah, but I'm 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 so pleased that you agreed to come on tonight. I've oh, so pleasure.
working with you and I've loved I've loved interviewing and listening to your story you know of how you came into this because I've never asked you before how, how it happened and why why you do what you do and how yeah. it happens and so on no I find we've never it, had that conversation it's really similar I've, when I've, you know I've, I've done I don't know about maybe about six interviews now and it seems like for a lot of people it, it, we're all very similar in how it seemed to be the right time in the right way with our own sensitivity yeah. and, it, and, it, and it brought a lot of answers to us. Absolutely. Mediumship. You Absolutely. Know. And, I I, know, and I know that you love your work. I know that yeah, you can I feel do. it, you can see it. I know that that's what excites you, you know, and, and as I said before, it is a form of addiction, but I just want to say to you, thank you so much. It's been oh, fantastic my- having you with me tonight. My pleasure. Thank you.